Hello everyone, welcome to another session of Lucid Mails. Today, let us take a look at the Lokpal and Lokayukta Act of 2013 because the government has finally made an appointment of the first Lokpal. Now, this topic is important mostly for your GS2 and SA preparations. So, let us begin by looking at the history of Lokpal. The system of Ombudsman was first established in Sweden. In similar lines, an anti-corruption ombudsman for India was first recommended by the first Administrative Reforms Commission back in 1966. Since then, until 2011, Lokpal bills were introduced over eight times, but unfortunately, none of them were passed. Finally, as a result of a public movement for a Gen Lokpal bill, the Lokpal and Lokayita Act was enacted in December 2013, but even after its enactment, the Act has been battling it out at the Apex Court for nearly five years. At one point, the Court even initiated contempt procedures against the government for its inability to implement the Act. So, let us take a look at the Lokpal Act. The Act primarily seeks to create a Lokpal at the centre and Lokayitas in states to look into cases of corruption against certain categories of public servants. This includes the likes of Prime Minister, Union Ministers, Member of Parliament, officials of the Union Government under groups A, B, C and D, chairpersons and members of any boards, corporation or autonomous body which are either established by an Act of Parliament or funded by the Centre. It also includes any society that receives funds and contributions above rupees 10 lakhs from foreign entities. It also covers the members of the Lokpal itself. Now, here, even though the Lokpal can investigate allegations against the Prime Minister, certain safeguards are provided in this regard. The Lokpal cannot simply initiate inquiry into any corruption charge against the Prime Minister if the allegations are related to international relations, external and internal security, public order, atomic energy and space. An inquiry into such matters can be done only if a full bench of the Lokpal considers the initiation of a probe and at least two-thirds of its members approve it. Besides these features, the Act also provides for confiscation and attachment of any property which has been acquired by the government officials through corrupt practices. Such confiscations can be done even during the time proceedings are pending in the court. The Act also empowers the Lokpal to set up an inquiry wing and a prosecution wing, each to be headed by a director. Now, talking about the composition of Lokpal, it is a statutory body comprising of a chairperson and a maximum of eight members who are chosen by a selection committee. This selection committee is headed by the Prime Minister and its members are the Lok Sabha Speaker, Leader of Opposition in the Lok Sabha, Chief Justice of India or a Judge of Supreme Court nominated by him, and an eminent jurist who can be nominated by the President or any other member. The chairperson should be a former Chief Justice of India or a former Judge of the Supreme Court or an eminent person with impeccable integrity and special knowledge with minimum 25 years of experience. Now, regarding the eight members, the Act states that half of the panel will consist of judicial members who should be either a former Judge of Supreme Court or a former Chief Justice of High Court. Regarding the remaining members, the Act states that minimum 50% of the members should be eminent persons from SC, ST, OBC, minorities and women. Now regarding the salary, allowances and other conditions, the salary and allowances of chairperson are equivalent to the Chief Justice of India and those of the members are equivalent to a Judge of the Supreme Court. The term of office of Lokpal members and the chairman is 5 years or until they attain the age of 70 years. Once their term is over, neither the chairman nor its members are eligible for reappointment. They are not eligible for any diplomatic assignments, appointments to constitutional posts as administrators of union territories or further employment under the government. These members also cannot contest presidential, vice-presidential, state or central legislative or even panchayat elections for a period of five years after ceasing to hold office. Besides these, 
the Lokpal will have a secretary who will be appointed by the Lokpal chairperson. The secretary will be of the rank of secretary to the government of India. Now let us look at how the Lokpal functions. Any person can file a complaint under the prescribed format against a public servant. However, these complaints must pertain to an offence under the Prevention of Corruption Act. Once a complaint is received, the Lokpal may order a preliminary inquiry by its inquiry wing or refer the investigation to any agency including the CBI if there is a prima facie case. But before ordering the investigation, the Lokpal shall call for an explanation from the public servant to see if there is a prima facie case. Now during the period of inquiry, the agency has to seek comments from both the public servant and the competent authority. For this, the Act designates a competent authority for each category of public servant. For example, for the Prime Minister, the competent authority is the Lok Sabha and for the Ministers, it will be the Prime Minister. For department officials, it will be the Minister concerned. The agency will have to complete its preliminary inquiry and submit the report to the Lokpal within 60 days. Now to consider this report, a Lokpal bench consisting of no less than three members is constituted. After giving an opportunity to the public servant, the bench decides whether it should proceed with the investigation. It can order a full investigation or initiate in departmental proceedings or even close the proceedings. It can also proceed against false complaints. The Act also lays down timelines for completion of these various stages. The preliminary inquiry should be comp normally completed within a period of 90 days from the receipt of complaints. The trial will be held in public in special courts and should be completed within a year. If for some reason it fails to complete within a year, the reasons for the same should be given in writing and an extension of three months can be given. However, the total period should not exceed two years. Now, let us look at what all benefits this act provides. The most relevant benefit is that it strengthens the efforts against corruption. Unlike the traditional system, the Lokpal proposes to give decision-making power to highly qualified individuals who are neither bureaucrats nor politicians. This ensures that the Lokpal is effective and impartial in its functioning. The Act also mandates the public servants to declare their assets and liabilities along with that of their spouse and dependent children. This ensures that amassment of unaccounted wealth is kept under check. Besides this, in order to strengthen the Act, it grants the Lokpal with powers to search and seize documents and confiscate property. Another benefit of the Act is that it cuts through layers of bureaucracy and permissions that are currently needed to be taken before putting elected members and officials on trial. This ensures ease in the process of investigation. However, as such a provision is prone to misuse, the Act also provides for punishment against false complaints. The Act provides for an expeditious disposal of complaints and trials which ensures speedy completion of cases. Another critical benefit of the Act is its independence. Generally, the party in power has a tendency to interfere in autonomous institutions. The best example is the CBI. In recent times, the RBI too has been facing such similar interventions. But when it comes to the Lokpal Act, the selection committee itself comprises of entities from various spheres. This bipartisan representation ensures that the Lokpal is not under the control of any particular group or do not flex according to the interest of the ruling party. Finally, the enactment of Lokpal has aided in enhancing India's reputation globally. For many years, India has been looked upon by global investors with skepticism due to its rigid laws and corrupt offices. But with the introduction of Lokpal and other acts such as the insolvency court and e-auctioning processes, this view has begun to change. The same is visible in India's improvements in ease of doing business ranking and the Corruption Perception Index. Now moving on, let us take a look at the concerns that still surround this act. The first concern is regarding the provisions of Leader of Opposition in the Selection Committee. 
As you may already know, the present Lok Sabha has no recognized leader of opposition. Citing this, the government has delayed the appointment of Lokpal for five years. In 2014, amendments to address this issue was introduced and subsequently approved by the Parliamentary Standing Committee. However, they have not been passed by the Parliament so far. The next concern is regarding the opaque procedures in the Act. The Act is silent on the professional standards that are necessary for a Lokpal. Without any clear guidelines, it is difficult to guarantee the office's efficiency or insulation from government influence. This opacity is clearly visible in the fact that the shortlisting criteria appointed by the present search committee has not been released by the government. Another concern is regarding the dependence of Lokpal on other investigation agencies. Until the government appoints a separate investigation and prosecution wing, the Lokpal will work using existing bodies like CBI which presently suffer from severe political influence. But to ensure fair and professional investigation, especially against those which might involve senior members of the government, these agencies like the CBI must be functionally independent. But this is not the case. To add to this concern, the Act is silent on how agencies like the Lokpal and the Central Vigilance Corporation will coordinate with each other. Now, with respect to states, the delay in appointing Lokayaktas has been a major concern. Many states like Jammu and Kashmir, Telangana, Tripura and West Bengal have not appointed any Lokpal. The reason for the same is simply the lack of political will. Another doubt is whether or not this act will adhere to its timelines. For example, the newly created Insolvency and Bankruptcy Court has very tight deadlines, but most of these deadlines are regularly breached. So it needs to be seen whether the Lokpal can adhere to such similar deadlines. Lastly, there is the delay in finalizing rules. For instance, the filing rules for government officials to declare their assets have not been finalized yet. This has resulted in the deadline being repeatedly extended. This again undermines the efficiency of the Act. To conclude, there is no doubt that the Act ushers in a new era of justice. It is not only in line with demands from the civil society and various stakeholders, but also shows India's commitment towards the United Nations Convention Against Corruption. However, certain changes are needed to the present system to resolve some of its drawbacks. This includes changes related to the leader of opposition criteria, introducing transparency into the selection process, and finalizing on rules related to the disclosure of government assets by government officials. These are essential for the efficient working of the Lokpal in the long run. Also, while the Lokpal Act is in place, a number of other supporting bills which addresses issues related to corruption are still pending in the parliament. This includes the bills related to citizen charter and electronic public service delivery. These bills, when passed, would strengthen the anti-corruption initiatives of the country. It also ensures that the institution of Lokpal does not get flooded by day-to-day -day complaints of administrative inefficiency and corruption. Above all this, one should always remember that the effectiveness of a law depends on how well it is implemented on ground. In the past, governments had enforced institutions like the Central Vigilance Commission and the CBI. But despite a few historic cases, these institutions have mostly failed to prevent widespread corruption in the country. Thus, it all depends on how well the Lokpal is implemented. But for this, there is a need for cooperation and active participation of government judiciary as well as the common people of the country.